Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining our session today of the Synthetic Intelligence Forum online. My name is Vic Pant, and I'm your host for this session. Very happy to present a session on beneficial AI addressing global hunger with AI, edge, and IoT for agriculture. Uh, it's my pleasure today to welcome a distinguished speaker, a thought leader, an industry leader from Microsoft, but also somebody who's contributed uh, immensely to the academic realm as well, uh, is a well-accomplished scholar and researcher in the field of, in many fields actually, uh, including the, the topics we're gonna talk about today from IoT to AI to wireless networks to a to blockchain and, and other topics like that uh, very happy to be joined today by uh, by dr ranveer chandra who joins us uh, from from microsoft and today dr chandra is going to talk about uh, farm beats which is a very interesting initiative that brings together these various technologies in a very complementary and synergistic manner to truly achieve the goal of ai for good or responsible ai so without further ado dr chandra i'd like to welcome you to the stream and i uh, would like you to introduce yourself a little bit and then we'll go into your slideshow thank you yeah thank you vic i'm uh, hello everyone i am ranveer uh, i'm the chief scientist of azure global and today i'll talk to you about a problem that I have been working on for over five years. This is on how do you feed the world? How do you solve, help solve the world's food problem? That is, how do you, one of the problems there is how do you grow more food, not just grow food, but grow nutritious, good food without harming the planet? And one of the most promising approaches to address that is that of data-driven agriculture. But before I get there, let me talk a little bit more about myself. So. Uh, why did why why am I interested in this problem? So my background is not in agriculture. My background is in computer science. I did my PhD in computer science from Cornell University, and I joined Microsoft right after that. But growing up, I spent a lot of time in my grandparents' farm in North Bihar. This is Bihar is one of the states in India, and this was a smallish farm. Back then, I did not like anything to do with agriculture. I would go to these farms and the, these villages, they did not have any electricity, they did not have any toilets, but that did give me exposure to a lot of really primitive forms of agriculture, a lot of poverty. And that's been one of the driving forces behind why am I trying to address this problem? So then going back to the question of how do we help improve the farmer's lives? How do we help address the world's food problem? One of the most promising approaches to address that is that of data-driven agriculture. One of, what would data-driven agriculture enable? Well, with data-driven agriculture, for example, you can map every farm in the world. You could overlay that with data. For example, what is the soil moisture level six inches below the soil throughout the farm? What's the soil nutrient level? What's the soil temperature level? If you could build maps like this, it would enable techniques such as precision agriculture. That is, you could apply inputs in different parts of the farm when they, are, when they are needed, where they are needed, as much as is needed. For example, if you had a map like this, you could apply fertilizer only where it is needed. You could apply water only where it is needed. And precision agriculture has been shown to improve yields because you can take care of plants better. It's been shown to reduce cost because you use less water, less pesticide, less inputs. It's also better for the environment for the same reasons. You're not wasting water. You're not wasting pesticide. And in fact, it's not just about the production side of ag. If you look at the entire food value chain, all the way from production agriculture to inputs, to logistics, to food processing, to, uh, to even the warehousing to the retail stores, the entire food value chain, each entity in the food value chain could benefit from data and data-driven insights. They could all get data and improve their efficiencies. But in fact, much more opportunities can be unlocked if throughout the food value chain, different entities could start sharing the data with one another. For example, if you have uh, an, a, an advisory, AI-based advisory that could get data from the farm, from the input companies, even from, in some cases, logistics companies, it can tell farmers when to plant, when to harvest, what to do when in the farm. Similarly, with traceability, you could track a piece of produce all the way from the farm, how it was grown, all the way how it ends in your table. There are a huge number of opportunities that could get unlocked in agriculture with data-driven agriculture. That is, 
being able to collect data from throughout the food value chain, as well as being able to share data with different entities in the food value chain. However, despite the benefits of data-driven agriculture, the, the adoption of data-driven agriculture is severely limited in agriculture. And the biggest reason we believe this is limited is because it's just extremely hard to get data from different parts of the entire food value chain. That had led to the start of the Farm Beats project at Microsoft. And today I'll talk about some of the innovations that we have been looking at at Microsoft, including Microsoft Research, Azure, and different teams within Microsoft on how do you help make agriculture and food more data-driven. And I'll talk about some of these innovations as well as some of the products we are building that brings together a lot of technology from the Internet of Things to artificial intelligence to edge compute to the cloud. How do you bring all of these together to drive the disruption, the, to, to, to drive the transformation of one of the most oldest industries that we have right now. So one of the first reasons existing solutions are expensive is because of connectivity. That is, the farmer's house might have some sort of connectivity to the internet, but the farm itself could be a few miles away. So the question then is, if the farm is a few miles away, how do you get data from the middle of the farm to the farmer's house? To address this problem, we use a technology that I have been working on for um, over 15 years now. This is called the TV white spaces. The idea what TV white spaces enables is, imagine if you have a Wi-Fi like router that you can access the connection a few miles away. And the way we do that is we took these Wi-Fi signals and we put them in empty TV channels. This is over the air TV, the TV you watch using antennas. You know, when you browse through TV, on certain channels, you see a TV transmission. The others, all you see is white noise. The key innovation, one of the innovations that we had done back then was a way to put a Wi-Fi signal in these empty TV channels. The benefit of, putting, of using these TV channels is that compared to Wi-Fi at the same power level, in UHF TV channels, your signals go four times farther. In VHF, they go 12 times farther. And that's in free space. Once you put in trees, crops, canopies, your signals just keep going through. And the interesting thing for agriculture is that TV towers are in cities. You have TV towers in Seattle, you have TV towers in Toronto. The farms are away from the cities. So if you turn on a TV in the middle of a farm with antennas, most of the channels will be just white noise. And the more noisy channels there are, the more unused capacity there is. So in the middle of a farm, if you have like 20 TV channels available, that's like 20 times six megahertz is each channel, you're talking of 120 megahertz of available capacity, which is close to uh, 400 megabits per second or more of available capacity in the middle of a farm. At that point, you're not just talking of connecting sensors. You could be connecting drones, cameras, tractors, streaming a lot of information that you just couldn't transmit before. So we, uh, at Microsoft, we launched the Airband program through which we are using TV white spaces, but other approaches as well to bring connectivity to rural areas, to bring broadband to remote areas and enable applications such as education, agriculture, and various uh, other scenarios that would benefit once you get broadband in these rural communities. The other thing I wanted to add is most very recently, a, a few weeks back, the FCC in the US, uh, they passed new regulations in the TV white spaces that, uh, that allow TV white spaces to go even further, especially in rural areas. So previously, back in 2010, the FCC had proposed the first set of regulations around TV white spaces, using which we could get about between, we say, five to 10 miles of coverage, using which we've done deployments in several parts of the world. More recently, the FCC is allowing higher the antennas to be placed higher and with more transmit power, using which you can start bringing connectivity in rural parts, including in the middle of farms. The second challenge, I talked about how you could reduce the cost of connectivity and sensing. The second challenge is how do you build these maps? I talked about building, say, a soil moisture map of what is the soil moisture level six inches below the soil throughout the farm? What if you had to build like a soil nutrient map or any of those? If you really had to build that kind of a soil moisture map, for example, you would need lots and lots of sensors. 
say if you have a farm, I gave you the question, what is the soil moisture level six inches below the soil throughout the farm? You would have to put, say, a sensor every 10 meters because as many of you would know, soil moisture level varies from row to row in a farm. But putting a sensor every 10 meters is expensive to deploy, to manage. It will come in the way of the farmer as the farmer does, to, does their day-to-day -day job. So the key question we asked was the last bullet here. Can we build a map like that using very few sensors? To address this problem, our key insight was to use drones. These are UAVs. You can buy them for about $1,000. They can cover large areas very quickly. And they, can, they have a camera at the bottom as well, using which you can get image data, visual data. And then the key innovation we built was a way to use artificial intelligence to combine data from a few sensors on the ground and use that aerial imagery to then interpolate this data and predict it in other parts of the farm where you did not have sensors. This works for many farms here, for example, in the US, in Canada. But as I had mentioned earlier, one of my passions is to bring these digital technologies to smallholder farmers, say in India, in sub-Saharan Africa. Drones are great for the developed world, but they don't work as well in the emerging markets, in the, in these, uh, in the developing world. So, and the main reason is that drones, they are still expensive. They still cost over a thousand dollars. They have limited battery life in a, in a single uh, charge. A drone would fly say 30, 35 minutes, most of these commercial drones. And in some countries we ran into regulatory concerns. That is when we had to fly the drone, we had to get a permission from the Ministry of Defense, which was not gonna happen. So then the question we asked was, how do you, if you can't fly a drone for a given farm, how can you get the aerial image of the farm. To solve this problem, we decided to go low tech. That is, we are using helium fill balloons. These are about four or five feet in diameter. These are tethered to the ground. They go up about 150, 200 feet. What we built was the mount you're seeing attached to the balloon, which is a weatherproof mount, to which a farmer could attach their smartphone with the camera facing down and this with a battery pack attached to it. And this thing can stay up from four to seven days taking images of the same part of the farm. And there are many scenarios that this could light up. For example, uh, there was a farm here close to Microsoft campus where we did a lot of demos. This was a smallholder farmer. Every winter, his farm would have floods and floods would last anywhere from 36 to 48 hours. The farmer right now, when he, wherever he came in the morning to the farm, he, if he saw any amount of flooding in any part of the farm, he would have to throw most of his crop because he didn't know which crops were touched by the flood. With this, because it can last from four to seven days, he has visual proof to see what parts of the farm were actually flooded and only throws away those, those part of the crop. But in fact, you can do much more than just a static balloon. Because labor is inexpensive in places like India and Africa, somebody could just walk around with the balloon and then we use computer vision techniques to then stitch this together to create these kind of orthomosaics of the entire farm. The key challenge here was that with drones, you know, they are mostly stable. The camera is usually facing down. When you have a balloon, your balloon moves around with wind. The camera is not always facing down. So we had to stabilize the imagery and then use that to stitch the imagery together to create these kind of orthomosaics. So drones and balloons are great to get aerial imagery, but you can't really get this for all farms everywhere. To scale, you need to use satellites. So but one of the biggest problems with satellite imagery is that close to 70% or more of satellite imagery has clouds in them. And if it is cloudy, you really can't see what's happening below. So the most, the state of the art is whenever you take, you get the satellite images, people use advanced AI algorithms to identify clouds, and then they would throw away the clouds so that you, they don't mess up with your AI models. But that, what that means is that whenever there's clouds, you're not getting any data of what's happening below the clouds. So one of the work we did very recently was this technology called SpaceEye, using which we are able to reconstruct what's happening below the clouds in satellite imagery. And the way we do this is using a GAN technique. We modified the generational adversarial network technique, GANs, which are used commonly in deep fakes. But instead of creating a fake, what we did was we use data from another satellite that goes around the earth that has radar in it. These radio frequency waves go through the clouds, 
they reflect differently from different surfaces, say if a uh, soil is moist or the plants are wet or not. And we use that reflected signal to reconstruct using this GAN approach, something which looks much more realistic. And we did this for, uh, uh, for various parts of the world. Here, what you're seeing in this, uh, in this uh, video is on the left is the state of the art, what you get from satellites right now. On the right are images that we're able to reconstruct. This is for a farm in Eastern Washington. As you can see, even though it is cloudy, we're able to reconstruct what might be happening below the clouds. So then once you get the aerial imagery, say from drones or balloons or satellites, then what we do is we take the images, say in this case from drones or satellites or balloons, we create this image. We intelligently place the sensors in the ground. We use those that intelligent placement of sensors with those wherever there are sensors to, to train the AI model. And then we use that AI model to start predicting what these values are throughout the farm. And we've created maps like this for soil temperature, soil moisture, soil pH, and many other variables that would be useful for, uh, uh, for agriculture, for farmers. So to summarize what we're doing in this part is we are getting data from aerial imagery, combining that with ground sensors to create these kind of maps for the farm using very few sensors. So with TV white spaces, you could bring down the cost of sensors. Using this approach, you need much fewer sensors than what you would otherwise need to start building maps of farms. This works great, but then another challenge that we ran into was, well, you could get large amounts of data from the farm to the farmer's house using the TV white spaces and do AIML, but you, if you can't transmit all of this data to the cloud, then you really can't get the benefits of all of this data. And what we realized is that farmers, many of the farmers, they don't have broadband connectivity. For example, most farmers in the US and Canada and other places have only one to three megabits of second connection to the cloud. And even this connection is prone to outages. There is a farm in upstate New York and we used to work with this farmer. Every time there was a snowstorm, there was a high likelihood that his internet connection would go off. So then the question is, if you're getting large amounts of data but can't send them to the cloud, how would you bring the benefits of all this AI, ML, all of this to the farmer? To address this problem, our key insight was that most farmers have PCs. If they don't have a PC, we ship them a PC form factor device, an edge device that sits in the farmer's house or office and does a lot of compute sitting in the farmer's house or office. And then we send summaries to the cloud where we then merge with other data streams, for example, from weather, from seed, from satellite data, and then send the, adv then send the uh, advisories to the farmer. Just double clicking a little bit on the gateway, what that is, is everything you're seeing in the gray box is what we were running on this gateway device. It's like a PC form factor device. It gets data from sensors. It gets data from drones. We are doing computer vision stitching with panorama generation. We then combine that with sensor data using the technique I talked about to generate heat maps, which then flows into these agricultural services, things like precision irrigation, precision pH, and so on. We also have uh, scenarios where you could get data from cameras streaming over, say, the white spaces where you're doing deep learning on the edge itself. I'll talk about the scenario in a bit. And all of this data is then synced with the cloud, uh, where all of this data is backed up in the cloud. In addition, we have storage, unique storage that's, for example, if you fly a drone, you could have a few gigabytes of data, if not more. Rather than sending the gigabytes of data to the cloud, you would be sending the summaries of that to the cloud while storing the raw data in, in disk and sending it uh, out of uh, uh, out separately to the cloud. Then we also have a web server for offline access. That is when you, have, when you lose internet connectivity, you should still be able to get access to the services. So there are many other innovations we did as part of this, but, to, but when this was in research, we actually did several deployments. We took this in several farms all the way from small farms of half an acre to big farms all the way from 9,000 9, acres or more. And just some use cases of how growers were using this. So this was for a, a farm in Eastern Washington. Well, one of the things we do, we were doing there is we were doing microclimate prediction. So, you know, for farmers, one of the problems that they, uh, that, that one of the key inputs to every farming decision is weather. That is, what is the weather going to look like in different parts of my farm. And each part of the farm could be different, especially if you're talking 
9,000 acres spread across multiple miles. Right now, the only option growers have is to look at the weather forecast, which kind of tells you the weather at the weather station, not necessarily what's happening in the farm. So one of the things we did here was whenever you take a sensor and put a sensor in the ground or just a weather station, we then not only tell you what the sensor values are right now, but then we combine that with weather station values to start making very hyper-local predictions of what these values are in that part of the farm. Like in this case, we started making predictions for soil moisture and soil temperature, where we are able to, uh, so in, over here what you're seeing is for three different models. And if you look at the red bar, we are able to make the, uh, the error in our predictions for soil moisture and soil temperature up to five days in advance is less than 10%. And the way we did that, we took weather station data from 50 weather stations across Washington state over the last seven years at 15 minute intervals. We used that to build the model. And then whenever you put a sensor, we then uh, start making very hyper local predictions for that part in the farm. So the farmer, one of the farmers that uses this is in Eastern Washington. Uh, he's a fifth generation wheat farmer. And when he looks at this data, whenever he's taking out his tractor, for example, what's the wind going to be? He farms 9,000 acres spread across 45 miles. And whenever he's taking out the tractor, he would look at, okay, what is the wind prediction in different, what's the wind going to be in different parts of the farm? Because if you're spraying any chemicals, you want, you want it to go where it is intended to, not being splattered around because of wind. The other use case, his testimonial is at the bottom left of the slide. That is, he was looking to spray herbicide in the farm and the uh, weather, stay, weather prediction was 42 degrees. We said it was going to be 31 degrees. It was actually 30. It was below freezing. It was good that the farmer did not put chemicals in the farm because that would have uh, hurt his crop. This is another use case I like talking about. This is in upstate New York. The farmer wanted to know how his cows are doing once they are out in pasture. So we flew the drone. We transmitted the data over the white spaces to an edge device. And within 30 minutes, we could start flagging things like from left to right, the grass is growing back well. There is a water puddle that needs to be fixed before the next planting season. The cows are pooping well, which was also important information for the farmer. So all the, for all the deep learning enthusiasts out there, this is deep learning on cow poop. This is where the cows are. This is a stray cow that needs to be herded in. All of this within 30 minutes of flying the drone. This is a farm close to Microsoft campus. We used to do a lot of demos here. Uh, Bill Gates came to this farm. He blogged about it on Gates Notes. This is a smallholder farmer. We show him these beautiful pictures and overlay it with data. For example, here what you're seeing is a soil moisture map. We were able to flag that the bottom left part of the farm is still moist, even though we did not have a sensor over here. This was another use case where after the farmer had applied lime, we were able to flag that these dark parts of the farm are still acidic. The farmer needs to reapply lime before planting the seeds. This is a deep learning scenario where we had put cameras in barns, uh, like up to three cameras, and we are tracking cows, seeing whether a cow is sick and flagging that information to the, uh, to the farmer. Now that was a, like a baby monitor for cows, right? You can have cameras and you can just be sleeping. You know what's happening in the barn. To think of it that for that scenario, if you did not have, say, the TV white spaces, if you did not have edge, those scenarios are very hard to, to enable. So then what we did was we took this from research to, so this was in research, and then we started taking parts of it and shipping it as part of a product. And this, I moved over to the product side two years back, and we shipped Farm Beats as a product last year. So for any ag tech companies that are out there, typically when you're building your ag tech solutions, you get data from a variety of sources, satellites, weather stations, and you then what you do is you clean the data, you analyze the data, and you then build these farm advisories, which are a lot of work. One of the first things we did with Azure Farm Beats was we're taking a lot of this undifferentiated heavy lifting away from you and running it as part of the Farm Beats system. So what we're doing is we have a data ingestion API. We, and then, so all the things you're seeing at the bottom is built by partners. So partner sensor companies, we take custom data. You could bring weather data, satellite data. You could bring all of that in into Farm Beats. Then what we do is we combine these different data streams using the AI machine learning techniques that I talked about. 
And then we enable APIs for you to start uh, adding your, your, your uh, custom solutions on top. And all, all these custom solutions are built by partners. This is a very partner-led approach where we work with different types of sensor companies, drone companies, partner equipment companies, as well as ag tech ISVs who can then start building these AI solutions on top of FarmBeats. And over the last uh, uh, year, we've announced partnerships with several companies, including Fessel Instruments, Davis Instruments, EarthSense Robots, DJI for Robots, very recently with DTN, uh, on uh, DTN, which is a, uh, a weather provider, we are bringing in DTN's weather data to Azure Farm Beats as well. And we've announced multiple partnerships with Azure Farm Beats, including, for example, we announced a partnership with Lando Lakes earlier this year, where we are working with Lando Lakes on digital agriculture with Farm Beats, on bringing broadband to rural America, as well as on building sustainable agriculture solutions. So that said, I wanted to also add a little bit more on continuing research that we are doing. While we ship the product, we are bringing in some of the existing technologies in the product. We are continuing to work on making digital agriculture even more affordable. And one of the technologies that it's still in research is that of bringing down the cost of these uh, sensor equipment even more. That's, and I'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing here. Right now, if you go to the market and try to buy these sensors for your farm, these sensors still cost a few hundred dollars, if not a thousand dollars. The question we asked was, can you make these even cheaper? Because at a, at a few hundred dollars to a thousand dollars, farmers would always ask what the ROI is. And especially if you're looking at smallholder farmers in places like India and Africa, they won't spend a few hundred dollars to buy a sensor in the farm. Well, even though they won't spend that, many of them still have a smartphone, even if they have an inexpensive smartphone. If they have a smartphone, it most likely has a Wi-Fi chipset in it. If it has a Wi-Fi chipset in it, the key idea we came up with was with the system called Strobe, was to use Wi-Fi to start measuring soil moisture and soil EC. The key idea was that once you transmit a Wi-Fi signal, the time of flight of a Wi-Fi signal of these waves through any material depends on the permittivity of the material. So if the soil is moist, it's going to take longer to traverse the same distance. Now the challenge is this, this distance is of the order of nanoseconds. This time is of the order of nanoseconds. And measuring that with Wi-Fi is difficult. And then the key insight we had was that most of these Wi-Fi chipsets have multiple antennas. So instead of measuring the absolute time of flight, if you could measure the relative time of flight, that becomes a tractable problem. And uh, we, we designed the system, we wrote a paper on it, which got uh, a best paper award at a top tier computer science conference last year. And we compared the results that we were getting with a state of the art sensor that we bought from, uh, uh, from uh, we bought online. And we saw that the results were very close to the actual results. So through all this work, what we, what we want to do is really democratize sensing. That is, can we envision a future where every farmer can get data from the farm. If they have a phone, can they bring the phone close to soil and start getting soil, soil parameters to drive the data-driven decisions? Another work that is still in research that we are continuing to do is on a system called Gaudi. That is, when we were working on this uh, system, we, we got approached by multiple AI companies that were talking about being able to do very accurate analysis of the farm from imagery and from other sources. The thing was, we didn't know how well it would perform. You really can't go to every farm and do this kind of analysis. For example, a company uh, was talking about measuring leaf area index that very accurately. If you had to evaluate how good this was, you would have to like go to a farm, take out a leaf, dry it out and measure the area, which is all very cumbersome. Instead, what we did was we built a 3D simulation for a farm. In this simulation, you can, you can change a lot of parameters in the farm. You can, for example, change the crop height, you can change the crop stress, you can change the, the weather, you can, you can change a lot of parameters in the farm. And then what you can do is you can fly a drone or you can take put the camera in a tractor and drive the tractor in this 3D farm. And once you do this, this then gives you the raw data which then flows into the rest of the pipeline. For example, the drone pipeline that I talked about before. Once you do that, you can use it for various purposes. You can use it to 
evaluate how well your algorithm performs in different types of farms. Sitting here, you can be evaluating what a farm in Malaysia or Indonesia looks like. You can try your algorithm out in different farm conditions. And you could also use this to improve your AI model, which is another very interesting thing about these simulation models. So I talked about some of the research we are doing with things that are more in advanced stage of research to very cutting edge stuff using things like Wi-Fi sensing to simulations. We're taking things from research, bringing in all the AI, all the other technologies that we are building. And like I talked about, we ship uh, we're shipping multiple products that are valuable for agriculture. For example, the Azure IoT for IoT-based scenarios, Azure Black Blockchain, there is Azure ML, which I did not put here. And of course, Azure FarmBeast that brings a lot of these things together, which is a very partner-driven solution. I just wanted to add one more thing about Azure FarmBeast is that it's not meant to be a grower-facing product. Azure FarmBeast is a product for other ag tech companies to start leveraging the latest of tech to build their ag tech solutions. So we enable bringing data together, provide AI, but we rely on partners who have the agricultural expertise to build these AI machine learning solutions on top. And then in the third pillar, we are not just stopping here, we are taking things all the way to, to societal impact. And some of the work we are doing there uh, around AI for Earth, which is, where, uh, which is a program through which we give funding to organizations that are using AI to solve some of the world's hardest problems. We were uh, around biodiversity, agriculture, climate change, and water. Through the Airband Initiative, which I talked about, we are working to bring broadband to, uh, to rural communities worldwide. Through the TechSpark program, we are working towards uh, bringing, skilling the rural population, that is uh, getting them more skilled for towards data so that they can then apply for a lot of tech, a lot of uh, 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 advanced jobs that are that are there in the market right now. One of the interesting things we did with TechSpark was uh, through the TechSpark initiative was we, uh, this was a partnership with the FFA, the Future Farmers of America, where we created a Farm Beats student kit. And for the Farm Beats student kit, it's, it's not just hardware, but we actually worked with the teachers, with the FFA to create a curriculum for the FFA, the high school chapters uh, of FFA. And the goal here is to expose students, even when they are in high school, to data, to AI, so that they can then start using the latest in technology for their farming practices. The other thing I wanted to talk about here is Microsoft earlier this year, we made, uh, we made several sustain, uh, announcements around sustainability and our commitment towards sustainability. One of the, uh, one of the announcements uh, in January was around carbon. So Microsoft has made a pledge to be carbon negative by 2030. When we say carbon negative, which it means that we're going to put back more carbon than the amount of carbon that we generate, the amount of emissions, the greenhouse gas emissions that we generate. And how do we get there? Part of the way we'll get there is by reducing our own emissions, but that's not enough. We need to do more. That is very, so there what we're looking at is we are looking at ways to, to purchase carbon credits, to invest in technologies that can help put carbon back into soil. And one of the promising approaches towards that is agriculture. That is, if farming is done the right way, it can help put carbon back into soil. And there, are, but but of course, but when I say the right way, it means things like uh, the right way could vary from farm to farm, and for different farms, the amount of carbon that you could sequester could be different. So those are some of the questions that we are currently looking to answer. We are continuing to work on this. For example, when should you plant a cover crop? What cover crop should you plant? Should you do no-till farming? How should you do nutrient management, water management in the farm? Those are all questions that we need to answer in order to get agriculture to be a good carbon sink, to be able to get farmers worldwide to be able to put more carbon back into soil without hurting their productivity. Productivity both in terms of yield as well as revenue for the farmers. We want the farmers to be profitable, even more profitable, while practicing sustainable agriculture. 
So to conclude, I talked about uh, uh, Farm Beats, which is about uh, a platform that we are building to enable data-driven agriculture, to bring in data from different data streams, from satellites, IoT sensors, on top of which you can bring your AI and machine learning to start creating new scenarios for farmers. And uh, to conclude, I want to say that uh, I know many of you are AI machine learning enthusiasts and are looking to see how AI machine learning could make a difference. Well, this is one way where through what we're doing here, we're just scratching the surface, bringing technology, one of the oldest industries in the world. But we need all of you. We need all of you to start thinking about scenarios. And there are so many problems in this space, some of which can be solved by existing AI and machine learning techniques. Others might require the invention of new techniques. But I'm confident that if all of us work together, we can help make a dent, make a positive difference to help address this problem of world hunger. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ranveer. That was an excellent uh, presentation. I very much enjoyed it. And, and there's, I have a few questions. There's a couple of questions in chat that I'd like to pose to you as well. So I, I think one question that comes to my mind right away is, Ranveer, you know, you talked about at the very one of the last slides, you talked about this notion of nature based solutions. So we think about, for example, forests as carbon sinks. And you also mentioned that if agriculture done the right way, I mean, after all, plants need sunshine, they need carbon dioxide to grow. Uh, so you could actually reach that. My question is a little bit more on the economic side though because you did talk about also farmer productivity and farmer uh, pro and, and farmer let's say profitability as well is you know it's important to get the science and the technology right but what kind of thought leadership is microsoft uh, sort of putting out there when it comes to the economics underlying sort of the environmental aspects but even just the hard dollars and cents aspects of, of building these types of data driven farms thank you yeah no that's a good question vic and one of the key, if you saw the underlying theme be below these innovations, it was all about how do you democratize data-driven agriculture? How do you make data-driven agriculture really affordable? And I'll just add a little bit more, bit more context to it, right? So when I started working on farm beads, one of the things I did was I went and interviewed several farmers. I actually spent a week in a farm in upstate New York. And when I went and talked to these farmers, not just in the U.S., in different parts of the world, what I realized is that Farmers know a lot about their farm. They have been farming there for decades, if not centuries. And they, like there was a farmer who could, who could pick soil, feel it, and say what might be going on. There was another farmer who would take and he would taste the soil and he would say, you know what, this might be going on with the soil. These farmers know a lot. But the thing is, even though they know a lot, a lot of decisions that they take is still based on guesswork. Like they know a lot about their farm, yet when to water, what to do is based on things that are out of their control and they assume that certain things are happening is where our thesis is that you, if, farm, if you could augment a farmer's knowledge with data and data-driven insights with AI, you can really unlock a lot of value. And that's what we are after. We are, like, we are after this scenario where we are not trying to replace a farmer. We are trying to make a farmer more powerful by bringing technologies which are affordable for the farmer to help them take much better decisions. And a lot of the work we are doing there is on making this data-driven agriculture more affordable, more usable. Like for example, things like TV white spaces or edge compute or using AI, where you can really, rather than putting a full-fledged, like a weather station, you can put low cost sensors and try to get similar kind of estimates of what might be going on in the farm. So these are some of the things we are doing on the uh, on the economics uh, uh, on the side to make things more affordable, to democratize technology to be used by all farmers everywhere. Thank you, Ranbir. So I'm going to put one of the questions in chat now. I think it really builds nicely on one of the things you just mentioned is bringing the existing knowledge of the science, of, of the farmers to the table. Uh, so there's a question here. When you were talking about data sources, do you also consider yield maps, historical yield maps into your models, into your predictions? Yeah, no, that's a very valuable source if you can get it. You don't get it for, uh, for every place. Like, for example, if you're going to uh, the emerging markets, it's hard to get that. But in the US, in the developed world, in Canada, you do get yield maps. And they're a very, very important source of information because they tell you how your farm, what works in that particular farm. You can really customize your predictions based on these yield maps. Yield maps, and that can help you tell you what the yield gaps are. That is how much you could have gotten and how much you're actually getting. What's the potential that you could uh, of, of improvement? So those are things that you could answer if you have yield maps into the model. 
Interesting. This is a very interesting question too, and perhaps I can just frame the question in the following way. You touched on a number of uh, things you're doing, uh, Ranveer, at Microsoft to democratize access to these sensors and compute and communications technologies. Uh, we've really heard this notion of frugal innovation or reverse innovation, where a number of devices are invented in perhaps let's say lower cost economies, and then they actually become very high impact, even in more higher uh, economically advanced economies, I, I should, I would add. So have you seen some of that going on? So for example, uh, if are you, are you developing solutions for Indian farmers with Indian thought leaders or are they all being made in the West and then taken to India? No, we are working with uh, people in India as well, innovators in India. We have a research team there. We work with academics there. And like some of the situations, some of the problems that you saw here were motivated entirely with the Indian, like the smallholder farmer in mind. Like when I talked about the balloon based imaging or when I talked about Wi-Fi based sensing, of course, if you if, if it works, if the Wi-Fi based sensing thing works, it could be very valuable even here. Like, for example, you can imagine a farmer putting it on there in there, putting a phone in the pocket or mounting it on a tractor and creating a map of the farm. But a motivation, a driving force there are farmers in, in places like India, Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia in general. So those are cases where we believe it's like the frugal innovation scenario we're talking about, right? Where it's a reverse innovation. You're, you're developing it for the emerging markets, but it could be very valuable even in the developed world. Interesting. Uh, just one more question for you, uh, Ranveer. This is a, a very interesting question too, as you reshape not just the technology landscape, but the market dynamics as well. Do you see a new class of entrepreneurs emerge, especially in certain markets where they become service providers uh, to the actual small farmer holder? Uh, and so that way it allocates the cost over multiple clients, but that way also the clients don't have to deal with the technologies which are implicated. Yeah, no, that's a very good question, Vic. And I didn't cover it in today's talk. That is through the work that we are doing, we are still addressing a very small part of the entire food value chain. We are helping drive data disruption in a small part, but there are many other pieces that need to come together if we really have to see the potential of the things that I was talking about today. And like, for example, you need input companies, you need various other people to come on board, partners to build solutions. But one of the things that you touched upon was new business models. And I think that's also going to be key to start driving. Like for example, uh, I think this is one of the scenarios that you meant. Rather than every farmer buying a drone, someone else going and flying a drone and getting data and pushing this all uh, to the cloud. That could be one. The other could be around sensing. Not everyone needs sensors in their farm. You could have like loan based, uh, not just sensing, but any uh, such IoT equipment where uh, someone else could be doing it as a service. And you're seeing a little bit of these disruptions happening in agriculture where people are thinking of farming as a service or precision ag as a service uh, or even seeds as a service. So this as a service model that's taken over many other uh, uh, business, many other industry verticals will come to agriculture. And there's the opportunity to drive this change to help for both for to improve farmer productivity as well as to just help grow better good food for, for the world. Great. And just one last question then, Ranveer, since we have a couple more minutes is, uh, I know you mentioned a number of players that you've partnered with, and it's truly a partner driven solution. So you've really built this platform. Uh, what about government agencies? Are you working with, for example, gov agencies at the federal, municipal, provincial, state levels across the world? Yeah, we have partnership with the USDA, which we announced last year with USDA ARS Agricultural Research Service, where we are partnering with them for their research farms, especially one of the one of the projects that's going on there is around cover cropping, being able to build the right cover crop model so that you can give custom advice to farmers as to what to grow where. How do you make cover crops more profitable in your farm? That's one of the things we're working with the USDA. We are working with CSIRO, CSIRO in Australia. So CSIRO, for example, on cutting edge research in the agriculture space. That's another work we're doing. And there are others too where we're working with different agencies to help them get more data to, to both uh, help farmers as well as drive the right policy decisions. 
Thank you, Ranveer. This was a very thoughtful and thought-provoking talk. And, and as we conclude this talk, I'd like to invite you back maybe in a couple of months to share some more updates with us as the technology advances so rapidly. And as you mentioned, business model innovation happens so quickly. And also you have a very warm welcome to come to Toronto, which is the home of the Synthetic Intelligence Forum once the whole pandemic lockdowns uh, minimized. So uh, thank you for your time, Ranveer. Very much appreciate your sharing your insights and your thoughts and your just deep expertise on this topic and very happy to see how you've synthesized all of those technological value propositions and turned them into a unified, cohesive platform that partners and, and just clients can really benefit from. So thank you so much and thank you for doing such a great job uh, that you're doing. Thank you, Vic. Really, really happy to be here and look forward to the feedback. Thanks. Yes. Bye for now. Bye.